Welcome to Accessible Art History, the podcast, the best place for art history lovers or anyone that is curious. My name is Annalisa, and I'm going to be sharing an amazing archaeological discovery with you today. Just a quick reminder before the episode starts, all sources and images will be posted on the Accessible Art History blog. You can find the link in the episode description as well as on Instagram at accessible.art.history. Now that we have that out of the way, let's get started. This week on Unearthed, we are exploring our first Buddhist site. Located on the island of Java in Indonesia, it's called Borobudur, and it's the world's largest Buddhist temple. The temple was built in the 9th century and has nearly 3,000 sculptures across the complex. Borobudur is a fascinating example of Indonesian Buddhist architecture, but was abandoned when Islam swept the country. Hundreds of years later, it was, quote, rediscovered during the British colonial period, and today it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. I can't wait to explore Borobudur with you. And before we get started, thank you to listener Kayla for sponsoring today's episode. The first and most noticeable thing about Borobudur is its size. In fact, it's the largest Buddhist temple in the world. It is constructed of nine stacked platforms. Six of them are square and the remaining three are round. At the top, there is a dome. The structure is decorated with over 2,500 relief carvings and there were originally 500 Buddhist sculptures. On the dome, there's an additional 72 Buddha sculptures, each with their own miniature stupa. Borobudur was built in a valley between two volcanoes, Sundoro Sumbing and Merbabu Merapi, and two rivers, the Progo and the Elo. This area is called the Karu Plain, and according to Javanese beliefs, this area is considered sacred because of its high agricultural yield. Some archaeologists believe that this is one of the major reasons that Borobudur was built at this site. When visiting the temple, there was a clear path that devotees were supposed to take. It led them through the temple to view the relief and statues, while also contemplating the philosophy and spirituality of Buddhism. Each new level brought the worshipper to a higher state of being. When they finally reached the top stupa, a symbol of enlightenment, their journey would be complete. So Borbador was not just a temple, but it was also a path through a sacred journey. Unfortunately, there are no records left behind about the actual construction of Borbador. Using a few inscriptions and relief carvings, most archaeologists date the building to around 800 CE. This means that it would have been built by the Shailandra dynasty. They were a series of devout Buddhist rulers, though a few did practice Hinduism, whose empire stretched from Indonesia to Thailand and the Philippines. The interesting thing is, however, that there was a sizable Hindu community in Java at the time, We know this from the remains of temples throughout the island, including in the Kidu Plain. However, the sites don't seem to show evidence of damage. This likely means that the two religions coexisted peacefully. Other than assumptions, there's not much we can tell about the construction of Borobudur. Mysteriously, within a few centuries of being built, Borobudur was abandoned. There's little to no evidence about this as well, but there are some theories. Due to its location, Borobudur was under constant threat of volcanic eruptions. There is some geological evidence that this happened, although they were smaller eruptions. In addition, we do know that King Mpu Sindok moved the capital sometime during the 10th century to East Java, meaning there wouldn't have been as many people around to support the temple. Finally, there is evidence that Arabic traders were in the area around then, spreading their new religion of Islam. In all honesty, it was likely a combination of all of these things that led to Borobudur being abandoned to the jungles. Next, we're going to examine how the site was, quote, rediscovered. But first, let's take a quick break. Hi there, my name is Annalisa and I'm the founder of Accessible Art History. My goal is to bring art history content to anyone that is curious. All my platforms can be accessed for free, but there are ways that you can support the cause. If you enjoy this episode, please consider leaving a rate and review on your favorite platform. I also have a Patreon and a Buy Me A Coffee account set up if you feel inclined to support Accessible Art History monetarily. However, I will always work to bring content for free because I believe that education should be accessible for those who want and need it. Thank you for listening, and now let's get back to the episode. All right, now that we're back, let's dive into the sculptures and relief carvings. 
These artistic elements are part of what makes Borbador so remarkable. As I mentioned earlier in the episode, there are around 3,000 carvings and statues spread throughout the complex. The relief carvings can be divided into three categories. Those showing Buddhist teachings, or the Dharma. Those depicting various events related to the Buddha's past lives, the Jataka tales. And finally, scenes from Buddhist scriptures, or the sutras. These were not only used to inform the faithful about different elements of Buddhism, but to also guide them through their journey throughout the temple. The idea of this journey was for adherents to move from darkness to light. As they walked through the temple, they would learn and understand how they were going to reach enlightenment. This was symbolized when they reached the top of the dome, as I discussed earlier, with the 72 Buddhas in their stupas. These details and sculpture programs show us that art isn't simply created to be beautiful. It also serves as a tool to help us understand the things that are bigger than ourselves. For 800 years after its abandonment, Borbador was swallowed up by the jungle. Locals knew of the sacred site, but the world at large forgot about it. Between 1811 and 1816, the island of Java was under British rule. Thomas Stamford Raffles was appointed Lieutenant Governor General of the island. He had an interest in the history of Java, and he used his position to conduct research and collect antiquities. While on an inspection tour to Samarang in 1814, Raffles was told about a monument temple complex that was deep in the jungle. Intrigued, he sent Herman Cornelius, a Dutch engineer who had already uncovered other ancient sites, to investigate. Over the next two months, Cornelius and his men dug out the earth and vines and cut down trees. They slowly revealed the site and sent a report back to Raffles. Over the next 70 years, various groups excavated and worked at the site. Eventually, the Dutch East Indies Company took control of the island and increased the work at Borbador. Their experts suggested that the artifacts, including the sculptures, should be removed and taken to museums in the West because the building was unstable. In all honesty, that wasn't exactly the truth. In fact, much of the site was looted during the 19th century, and some of it was even sanctioned by the acting government. Today, pieces can be found around the world. Although there was looting, these foreign governments did also try and restore Borbador. Unfortunately, there was a small budget, so restoration mainly consisted of cleaning things like vines and trees away from the area. The project was halted due to World War II, but in the 1960s, the Indonesian government sent out an international cry for help. They recognized that Borobudur was a crucial part of their history, and they knew it needed to be preserved for future generations. Five countries answered the call to contribute. Australia, Belgium, Cyprus, France, and Germany. UNESCO also joined the effort, and restoration took place between 1975 and 1982. Over one million stones were dismantled, cleaned, and cataloged, so they could be put back together like a giant puzzle. In total, it took 600 people and $7 million USD to restore Borbador to its former glory. In 1991, UNESCO declared the temple to be a World Heritage Site. It was given this honor because it not only represents the unique elements of Indonesian and Buddhist architecture, but it also exemplifies aspects of the Buddhist religion for people to experience and understand. Today, Borbador is Indonesia's most popular tourist attraction. Not only is it popular with them, but it also is an important pilgrimage site for Buddhists. Its spectacular architecture, rich history, and beautiful art make it a unique and spectacular place. Keep an eye out for next week's episode when I discuss the fascinating site of Chichen Itza. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of Accessible Art History, the podcast. Make sure to follow us on Instagram at accessible.art.history and keep an eye out for the next episode. They drop every Monday on your favorite podcast platform. If you prefer to listen on YouTube, episodes will start being uploaded in a few weeks, so subscribe there too.